Uh, so hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I have the uh, you know, amazingly great pleasure of uh, introducing Al Warden here. Here's his book, Falling to Earth, uh, which you should all run out and buy, and then you should tell all your friends to buy. How's that? <laughs> Good boy, Alan. Thank you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'll sell mine for uh, $55 right now, and it'll be worth every penny. Uh, no, no, I, uh, as I was telling him, and I, I sent a note around, I, uh, I grew up with a space program. I, we, my dad and I moved, uh, and my mom, and uh, from, uh, from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, down to Orlando, Florida, so that he could work at Martin Marietta as a mechanical engineer in an aerospace company. And we went to essentially every launch. So we would all pile into a car and drive over to the coast, which is about maybe 50 miles away or something like that. And uh, back in the day, you could watch launches from really, really close. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I still get goose pimples when I think about those launches and think about the, the, uh, the period of time when, uh, when I think there was a revolution in uh, technology and science and exploration and things like that. And I'm just so happy to have you here as a participant on uh, Thank you, in that uh, program. Uh, so you guys are going to ask most of the questions. I just want you to know that. So any of you that are just sitting there waiting for everybody around you to ask a question, or, or, or even worse, waiting for me to ask all the questions, you guys are going to have to start thinking like right away. Uh, but I do have a few here just to get us started. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I'll start with actually one of the, la one, one of the ones here, um, uh, which I know is near and dear to your heart, uh, which is uh, navigation. So we, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, getting the moon and getting back, <laughs> uh, you know, was, uh, well, why don't you actually start with okay. the computers, yeah, let me. how much support you had in that process, okay. and then talk about navigation in general. Okay. Uh, obviously, to go to the moon, you got to know where you are. you got to know where the moon is, <laughs> uh, which is kind of an interesting problem. Uh, we, we knew where we were launching from, uh, we knew where we were going, uh, and we kind of had to keep track of where we were on the way. Uh, we had a computer on board uh, that we used to help us make all those calculations, and in fact we could do our own um, navigation on board. Let me say this, there's a, there's a difference between the way the American space program is operated and the way the Russians are operated. Uh, the Russians uh, basically do everything from the ground. Everything is remotely controlled. Now, we have a lot of, of uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles these days that are run from a console somewhere outside of uh, Las Vegas, I guess. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. The Russians uh, fly their spacecraft from their mission control. And uh, those on board, uh, I guess, would, uh, could take over an emergency of some kind, but basically they're not trained to do that. As a matter of fact, the first cosmonauts that were flown in space, weren't e some of them weren't even pilots. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the early Russian space program, there was a gal who flew early in the program. Her name was Valentina Tereshkova. And her qualification for making that space flight is that she was the best parachutist in her club. Because, back in those days, they had to bail out at 10,000 feet on the way down. Uh, otherwise, they're going to crash into the Earth in that little spacecraft they had. Anyway, uh, we fly everything on board in this country. All, er, anything we do in space is actually flown by hand on board or flown by an onboard computer in some way, with a guy backing that up. So we had a computer on board to help us do those things. Uh, and that computer was... Uh, uh, was uh, designed back in the 1950s. Uh, it was a, a small hand-wired computer that fit into the instrument panel and it had a little disky that you, with buttons on it that we could uh, interface with the computer. And for all the activity, for all the stuff that we asked that computer to do, uh, it had a programmable memory of 75K. So you should also tell them what, what program was left out of yeah. the hard-coded well, that you had to, that you had to right. load later, just in case well, you might need it. Yeah. They didn't, have enough, they didn't have enough computer capacity to put all the programs in that we needed uh, to go to the moon and come back. So they left one out, and it was called the Return to Earth program, <laughs> uh, which, which might have been a little bit of a problem uh, if we'd lost our communications. Uh, that's, where we, that's where we'd have a problem. But, 
we were very success oriented, so it didn't slow us down any. <laughs> Uh, but the computer, the com what the computer did for us is it calculated angles and location for us. Now if you, you want me to go into navigation? Sure, yeah. Okay, we, we, we used uh, th uh, three reference systems to make the flight. Uh, the first one is, of course, an Earth-centered system so that when we're in Earth orbit, the, the center of the Earth is the center of the reference system. It's an orthogonal system, X, Y, Z coordinates. It's just a standard old orthogonal coordinate system. When we started on our way to the moon, we switched to a sun-centered system. Same thing, X, Y, Z coordinates. But it was a sun-centered system because the Earth and the moon and us were all in that solar system. And then as we got close to the moon, we switched over to a moon, to a lunar-centered system. So we basically used three uh, uh, different reference frames to get from the Earth to the Moon. Now we were in the Sun-centered system most of the time, and that's where we did our. That's where we did most of the navigation. Uh, the navigation was really fairly fairly straightforward. Uh, there there were two ways of doing it. One is Mission Control could tell us they had what they called a state vector, uh, and that's as you know, uh, 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 that's position, velocity, and time. Okay. So you got three axes, uh, uh, three coordinates of position, three of velocity, and one of time. <coughs> we could do essentially the same thing in space, but we did it in an entirely different way. When Mission Control, uh, as they were watching us, uh, they did all of their calculations based on ground measurements. There were three large space telescopes around the world at 120 degrees, uh, so that one of them was always locked onto the spacecraft uh, all the time. Uh, there, were, there, there were a couple of things that they looked for. One was they looked for range and range rate, and the other is they looked for direction. Kind of interesting, as I'm writing, as I was telling Alan, as I'm writing the book, I'm trying to sort all this out. And I'm talking to all of the people that worked in Mission Control back in the days when we made our flight, and I come to find out that they didn't understand this ground system. Uh, Mission Control was, uh, they, they spent 90% of their time talking about range and range rate, which gave, us, gave them our position plus our velocity, and they were very accurate. It was a pseudo-random range signal that they sent up, and that got turned around in a certain way, and, and when they read the return, then they could they could calculate where we were and how fast we were moving. Um, the other component, of course, is direction. And that's the one that Mission Control completely missed 20 years later. They forgot all about direction. And I'm, they, they kept thinking it was just range and range rate, but it, it was direction. I finally tracked down a guy who was a manager of uh, one of the space stations, one of the large space stations in Australia. And he said, oh yeah, of course, he said, we sent the trunnion angles to Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, and they then translated them into the other three large space telescopes uh, so that they had the trunnion angles to look at or to, to point to when the, when, the, when the Earth rotated and the spacecraft came into view, they had the trunnion angles to go to. <coughs> in flight, we did it a little differently. Uh, <coughs> we relied solely on the solar system and the stars. We had 37 stars in the sky that were the brightest, the 37 brightest stars. And they were our navigation stars. And what, we, what I would do in flight, I was a, kind of the navigator. Uh, what I would do in flight is I would find one of the stars in a telescope and then find the second star. And we had a sextant on board. I could, I, I could lock onto those two stars, you know, superimpose one on the other. And then the, the computer then would calculate the angle. Now what that gave us, if we do that orthogonally around the spacecraft, actually I did it in every direction I could find because, I, you know, you're, you always want to do one more. Uh, you never, you're never satisfied with, uh, with the last result you got. Uh, but what that did is that gave, that gave us an attitude within the solar system. Just attitude, that's all. Make sure we're pointed in the right direction. Now, to get location in the Earth-Moon system, you have to do something slightly different. Now, we take a star and we, do, we calculate the angle between a star and the near or far horizon of the Earth or the Moon. And that 
then triangulates or, or gives us a, a location within the Earth-Moon system. That's not as simple uh, as, as it might sound. Uh, the Earth is about 8,000 miles across. The Earth's atmosphere is 50 miles thick. When you compare 50 miles to 8,000 miles, it's not very big. <clears throat> but that 50 miles difference is enough to kill you on the way back. Okay? You cannot afford to have that kind of slack in your, in your calculation. So, what we did is we picked a color band in the Earth's horizon to, to do this uh, uh, sighting on. <coughs> I found that the color band blue, there's a light blue band of color around the Earth, and I found that I could find that repeatedly and I could use that as one anchor and then pick the star with the other side and bring those together and that would calculate location. So that's the NAV system on board, which is very different from the ground, which you only uses radio telescope data to tell where you are. In other words, direction and range and range rate. And it can tell very accurate. In fact, the ground had us within probably, I think, uh, four meters uh, or maybe, well, more than that. Let's say 10 meters and about four meters per second. That's what they had us all the time. Uh, and it's a darn good thing they did that because, uh, you know, as we're getting close to the moon, we never saw it. We were going in backwards, so we never saw the moon. So, <laughs> so it, was really, it was really nice that we had confidence that they, they had this thing calculated pretty well. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, one of the things that I thought was unusual about your book is you, uh, you uh, uh, told it from the perspective of the command mod module pilot, and I think that's one of the least understood roles in all of the uh, Apollo um, watch us. So why don't you talk a little okay. bit about the different roles of the different people? Okay, you know, it's, um, there, 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 there are two different ways of looking at the, the, at the things that the various guys did on flights. There's the way from the, from, from the Houston approach, the mission approach, the astronaut approach, and then there's the media approach. And the media has a very different take on what people do and how they do it on a flight than what really happened. Um, the truth is that uh, the, well, the ground rule was that you always had to have two guys, two people on board. One doing the flying, the other looking over his shoulder to make sure everything is okay. When you're doing a dynamic maneuver like flying the lunar module down to the surface, that's a dynamic maneuver and it required two people on board. I, w I stayed in orbit uh, and that was uh, okay because I didn't really do a lot of maneuvering. But the point was, yeah, that's why we had three people on the flight, okay? The commander on a flight, like Dave Scott was on our flight, is the guy who flies the lunar module down to the surface successfully, and then they get out and they walk around for two or three days, and then they get back in it, and they come back into Lunori. He's responsible for flying the lunar module down. They fly it like a helicopter. Jim Irwin was the lunar module pilot, and he was the systems engineer. He didn't get a chance to fly anything. Command module pilots guy does all the flying. And that's, that was what I liked. Uh, I flew everybody out. Well, Dave Scott actually was in command during, during the first 12 minutes of the flight. And that's till we got into orbit. And from then on, I was, it was my job. Tell him what uh, he did, what Dave Scott's role in Well, Dave Scott's role was. on launch was basically to put his hand on the abort handle. Uh, and be ready to twist it. And my job on the launch was to hold his hand and make sure he didn't. So, so it really didn't make a whole heck of a lot of difference whether he was in the left seat or not. But um, uh, yeah, he was, it, it would have been his decision. If something had gone wrong on the launch, uh, it would have been his decision to abort. And uh, Jim and I both agreed that we weren't going to let him do that. So we, <laughs> okay. uh, so, but anyway, his job was to fly the lunar module down the surface and back up again, and my job was to fly them all out there, stay in orbit by myself while they're down on the surface, and then when they come back in lunar orbit and rendezvous and dock, while they rendezvous and I docked, uh, then I'd get, I got to fly them all, all the way back home. So, like I say, I got, all, I got most of the, what we call stick time. Now, there's a, there's, there's a difference in the perception of what each crew member does as far as what the public sees. I mean, we talk about moonwalkers a lot, and there are 12 moonwalkers, and the guy that I flew with tried to make a big deal out of there being 12 moonwalkers. That's a rather significant number. Uh, and uh, he, he founded a Christian fellowship organization kind of based on 12 moonwalkers. I said, Jim, you're crazy, but that's, that's another story. Um, 
but uh, the lunar module pilot really was uh, kind of along for the ride. Uh, basically, there was never a, a design in the program for a lunar module pilot to ever be the commander. You had to become a command module pilot first because you gotta, you gotta learn one of the systems. You gotta learn it and fly it. You gotta live with it. You gotta make it work for you. Uh, a command module pilot does that with a command and service module and then what he's gotta do if he becomes a commander is fly, the, he's gotta learn how to fly the lunar module. So he's only got one more thing to le learn. Lunar module pilot never has a chance to fly anything so he's gotta learn both of them. So that's too much. That's, that's too big a job. So there was never a, never a program for a lunar module pilot to fly uh, as a commander. And the command module pilot was the shortcut to being a commander. And I, you know, that could have happened except they canceled the program out on us and so we never got a chance. So good. So uh, the, uh, one of the things uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, comes up a lot is, you know, what's it like in space? I mean, what, what was your life like? We were, um, we were in a vehicle that was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. We had 22, 220 cubic feet to play with. I'll give you some comparisons. Uh, Mercury spacecraft, the very first one, for one guy, had 40, 40 cubic feet of space for that one guy. Anybody here know what the volume is in a casket? <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens to be about 40 cubic feet. <laughs> okay. uh, Gemini program came along, that's a two-man program. And I'll talk about that for a little bit here in a minute. But Gemini program came along and that was, uh, I believe, 75 cubic feet for two of them. So that's like 37 and a half cubic feet for each one of them. Uh, then the Apollo program came along, and man, it was a Cadillac of the spacecraft. It, was, <laughs> it had 220 cubic feet for three of us. So we had as much space as one person would have had in a Gemini capsule all by himself. 222, 220 cubic feet of space. That's about what you find in a Volkswagen Beetle. And it's kind of interesting. You, you think about what it would be like we trained for three years for this flight. We trained in simulators and we trained together. We trained, we did all of that. And you think to yourself what it would be like to be in that thing for two weeks with these guys. And you really can't quite come to any sensible kind of understanding. Uh, but you find out when you get there. Uh, you know, it's the difference of uh, getting in a simulator for eight hours and then going home as uh, being in this thing for 24-7 and no way out. So you learn to do things. I learned to ignore the other two guys. <laughs> uh, basically, that was, that, was, that was my survival mode. It's just kind of ignore them. Uh, well, in your book, you said when they left for the moon, you just kind of relaxed, you know? It was well, like, finally, well, some time alone. Well, you know, that's, that's, that, that's kind of in response to questions I get from people. You know, a lot of people say, that, oh, the command module pilot, oh, you were in lunar orbit by yourself for three days. You gotta be the loneliest guy in the world. It's gotta be tough. You gotta be, oh, la, oh, la. Oh. And, I, and, I, and I'm very quick to point out that was the best time of the flight. Uh, I, I, got, I got rid of those two guys <laughs> for three days. Uh, and when I was back, when I was behind the moon, I didn't even have to talk to mission control, so. <coughs> so I was very happy by myself. <laughs> Uh, living, living in space is, uh, this, this, this may turn out to be the biggest problem that we've got to face if we really do long-term flights. Uh, I think the technology uh, will come along. I think uh, we'll be able to handle that. Uh, but I think the, 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 the psychological and the physiological uh, side of long-term space flight uh, it's going to be the thing that we're going to have to really face up to. In two weeks, uh, not enough happens to you. It's not really a problem. But uh, if we go for three years, like going to Mars, it's, that's going to be kind of a problem. Now, the things that uh, we had to kind of figure out on our flight, uh, in the first place, uh, you all know the term zero G. You've heard it. Zero gravity. And you all also understand, I'm sure, 
that there is no such thing. There is no zero gravity anywhere. I don't care where you are. There's no zero gravity. You can get that out of your mind right now. What we were in, our entire flight was free fall. Exactly the same condition as if we were to put ourselves inside a barrel and go over Niagara Falls. You know, you're in free fall going down. Now, the reason they kind of call it zero G is that the relationship between you and the can you're in, you're both going the same direction, same time, same speed, right? So you, with respect to the can, are floating around, and it's like zero gravity, okay? That's how that term got started. But in reality, there's no such thing. You're in free fall, but so is the can you're in. So you're floating around inside, and you got to learn all these different things that uh, you never really thought about before. Um, going to sleep the first night. It was kind of an interesting experience. Uh, we had sleeping bags. They were made out of a fishnet type material. Uh, the whole sleeping bag probably didn't weigh more than four ounces. Very, very flimsy. Uh, but in this free fall condition, um, you don't need much. It had strings at each end. They were like shoelaces. And you're to tie the shoelaces to something in the spacecraft to stretch this thing out. And I decided that uh, I'd do something a little different. So I got a paper clip and I tied the string to a paper clip on each end. And I just hooked the paper clip over a bolt head on either end. And uh, that would stretch out the sleeping bag and I'd slide in it. And, and uh, the sleeping bags were uh, made only to come up to your neck. So I slid into the sleeping bag the first night with my head outside and tried to go to sleep. Well, that's a little bit of a problem. You know, we are used to certain things here on Earth. And gravity is one of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's hard to imagine what it's like if that gravity's not working on you. But we go to bed at night here on Earth. We get into bed. We put our head on a pillow. Son of a gun, it stays there. Why? <laughs> because gravity's holding it down, right? When you get in space and you're in this kind of free fall environment, there's nothing to hold your head down. So if the sleeping bag comes up to your neck, you lay there and you try to go to sleep, all of a sudden you find that your head's starting to wander on you. <laughs> and you realize that your head's got a mind of its own. It's just kind of doing certain things. So the first night out, I had to unzip the sleeping bag, put my head where my shoulder would be, and it, which was a little shorter than I am, and zip it back up, and I went to sleep very easily because it held my head in shape. How many of you ever, just as you're falling asleep, had the feeling of falling off a cliff? <laughs> Anybody ever done that? Oh, yeah. I think we all have. We just don't want to admit it. Well, this is exactly what we're doing is falling off that cliff in free fall. That's exactly what we're doing. So you got to... Second night, not so bad. Third night, didn't even need the sleeping bag. You get weak. Humans are very adaptable, and we get, we get into this space thing physically very easily. As a matter of fact, it was such a, after a couple of days of adjustment, uh, it was so much like home that I had that kind of thing in the back of my head that said, gosh, you know, I've been here before kind of thing. It's like deja vu. Uh, and it makes you wonder if there's not a little genetic thing in our brains uh, that says, hey, you know, we've been here before. Uh, anyway, that's, that's for another time. Uh, but anyway, that's, by the third night, I could just curl up in a ball and go to sleep anywhere. Uh, very easy. The next thing was food. And I'm going to take you through the whole god dang bloody mess here, so just bear with me. <laughs> uh, the next thing is food. We had freeze-dried food, mostly. We had some that was radiated, like roast beef and hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff like that. But most of the food was freeze-dried. Uh, it was made by a company up in Michigan uh, called Whirlpool Corporation. And they made some 300 different varieties of freeze-dried food. We had to test all this food before the flight to see if there was anything that we were not compatible with, obviously. Something that wasn't good for us. So I tasted all 300 different kinds of freeze-dried food. And, and I filled out a question sheet. And our, and our dietitian down in Houston, Rita, uh, wanted to know how we 
you know, how we were doing all this food. So we, I gave her back the list. And she says, you know, we're going make, we're, we're to make menus for you. I mean, you know, looking at me. Oh, that's great. So two weeks before the flight, I get my menu. And I, Jim Irwin's my roommate. And he's the guy that flew with me. Uh, we compared menus just for the fun of it. And they were the same. <laughs> and so, so we went to Dave Scott and looked at his menu and compared them, and they were the same. So he said, I think Rita's handed us a bunch of you-know-what, so uh, let's go check the Apollo 14 crew. So we went and got the menu for the Apollo 14 crew, and guess what? They're all the same. It's government food. And the, 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 the issue was that if you absolutely couldn't stand something, they'd take it off from everybody, but the menus were all constant. They're all, they're all the same menu, consistent. <coughs> anyway, food's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, oh, incidentally, drink. We had all this freeze-dried food, but we also had drinks on board. Does anybody know what kind of fruit drink we had? Uh, tang, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me just mention Tang. Uh, the, last, the last time uh, I had a swallow of Tang uh, was over 40 years ago. Uh, on my way back home from the moon, uh, and that was only because it's the only thing I had. Uh, I decided after that that I had never, never, ever have that stuff again. It was terrible. <laughs> I like coffee, so I had freeze-dried coffee made up. And I had freeze-dried coffee black with cream and then with cream and sugar, and depending on my mood, then I'd get out the kind, you know, like after dinner, I like a milkshake, and so I'd get out the cream and sugar and all that. And uh, talking to Dave Scott and Jim Irwin, the guys that flew would say, what, what, what are you gonna drink on a flight? I said, I'm taking coffee. I gotta have my coffee. I, that, I wake up every morning. The only way I get my heart started in the morning is to have a cup of coffee, right? Oh, we're going to drink hot chocolate. Oh, God, you are? Why? Well, we don't want caffeine. We're not going to touch that caffeine in coffee. We're not, we don't want that. And I said, well, boy, I'll tell you what, I think hot, you're going to drink hot chocolate three times a day for two weeks? I really wonder if you can do that. Oh, yeah, we're going to drink it all the time. So off we go. I got my coffee. They got their hot chocolate. Three days into the flight, I'm checking my coffee supply, and it's way low. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had a little confrontation about that, and, uh, and uh, uh, I had to kind of hide it after that because they're drinking my coffee. Uh, but this is the kind of thing you run into, you know, in flight. Okay, now the food, the freeze-dried food was, that's, that's kind of fun. For a meal, we'd have maybe five bags of food each, okay? Uh, there'd be a, like a soup and then a salad and an entree and then something else and then a dessert and whatever, five bags. You got to reconstitute all this stuff. I mean, it's hard as a brick when you get it, right? It's in a plastic bag. It's got a little nozzle or a little opening uh, uh, like an inflation valve on a, on a bicycle. And you got to stick the water gun. We, had, we did have hot and cold running water on, our, on board. Uh, we, we generated our own water as we went. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with all, not the kind you're thinking. Uh, no, we had, we had, we got our energy from fuel cells. And the fuel cells used hydrogen and oxygen, and the byproduct is water. Okay, and we got electricity and water. So we had our fuel tank full. Uh, but we, and then we had, a, we had the, the, probably the first instant hot water. If you squeeze the trigger on the, the little switch on the pistol, it was like a pistol. Little switch is either hot or cold. So you go to hot, squeeze the trigger, you get one ounce of hot water. Squeeze it again, you get the next. So if the package says four ounces of hot water, you go squeeze, 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 squeeze. Uh, and that's the way you got it. Uh, so you reconstitute all five bags. Now there's three of us on board, so that's 15 bags of food. And it takes a while for this stuff to reconstitute. So we're waiting for 20 minutes probably. What do you do with 15 bags of food in space while you're waiting for it to reconstitute? Well, we tried every scheme we could think of. We, we, we went to Velcro, and that got to, be, that's, that, that got to be complicated. We went to, actually, we went to a clothesline and clothespins uh, for one try, and we didn't like that. So finally, we decided the best thing to do was just let them go. Just let them float. Well, it, it, we didn't realize this when we were on the ground, but when we got in space, we, found, we figured out that the air conditioning system inside the command module blew the air around in a circular fashion around inside. <laughs> The spacecraft. So we just put the food in that, and they just go bump, 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 bump. <laughs> like a big 
like a big lazy Susan. And, <laughs> and, and all, you had, all you had to do was wait for your color code. Our food was all color coded, red, white, and blue. Uh, each of us had a color. Uh, 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 Dave was uh, blue, Jim was red, and I was, of course, I'm white, obviously. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the good guy. Uh, so anyway, you wait till the whole bag comes by, it's got a little white tab on it, you pull it out of the stream, cut the top, eat the food. Now, here's another thing about gravity that you, you know, there's a, there's a difference in this business when you get into space. Why is a spoon designed the way it is? <laughs> <laughs> we don't often we don't often think of these things, right? But there's the truth. Here's the truth about this. Spoons have been around as long as people, I think. But a spoon is designed to take advantage of gravity, right? Are you with me? What do you think happens in space? <laughs> well, there are a couple of other phenomena that work with this. A spoon you take, you take a, 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 say, soup, and you get a spoonful of soup and you can hold it, and the, the soup's pretty level, and you can hold it and it stays there, right? And gravity keeps it in. When you get in space, you got two other things working for you. One is the adhesion of the liquid to the spoon, the bowl of the spoon. We actually carried regular soup spoons with us on flight. Adhesion keeps it in, you know, sticks to the spoon. Surface tension then Holds, it, holds the top of it, but you don't get a level spoonful. You get a big ball of soup on your spoon, okay? And that ball of soup that's on your spoon is a function of what the surface tension is that holds it there, okay? So you get your, you, you, you dip it into the bag, you get your spoonful of soup, and you got this ball of soup, and if it's too hot, you just let go of it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we, wouldn't think, we wouldn't think of doing that down here, but. Uh, up there, you just let go of it and it kind of floats around. As long as it doesn't bang into something, why, you know, it comes back to you and it's a little cooler and you can eat it. <laughs> uh, okay, well, we, we did have a problem. We did have a problem one day. We had tomato soup one day. And um, the bag got popped open a little too fast and it, and it broke the surface tension of the soup inside the bag. And the, ball, the, the, the whole portion of soup came out of the bag, and it was a ball about this big around. And you know, it's really kind of interesting to watch these things happen in space, because that ball is a perfect sphere, and it just kind of starts floating around. Probably the most serious thing that happened to us on the flight was that ball of soup. That was, that, that was almost panic, Phil, because if that ball of soup gets behind an instrument panel, and breaks the surface tension, and you, now you got a thousand little balls floating around and shorting out electric components here and there. That's not a good thing. Now, I maintain this is why we send people into space, is to solve these kinds of problems. <laughs> we are never gonna have, the one thing I found out about making a space flight is that the problem you're gonna have in flight is something you never thought about before flight. Always going to be something different than you had figured out. Well, that ball of soup floating around is one of them. And you, you know you can't touch it with a spoon because the minute you touch it, you break the surface tension. Now you got a thousand. Can't go after it with a straw. What do you suppose we did? I know. I read the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very simple solution. Got a towel, wrapped it around it, and absorbed it. Simple solution, but you tell me a robot that can figure that out. I don't think it'll do it. Because there's always going to be the very unusual kinds of problems that crop up on a flight. Uh, and, and that was one of them. Okay, so we've got all this food. We've been eating three squares a day. One of the problems uh, initially in space is uh, not being hungry. And again, that's a function of gravity. When you eat a meal, that meal sits on the bottom of your stomach and the sensors on the bottom of your stomach in our one gravity environment tell you you're full. When the food's all gone, those sensors say, gee, I'm hungry. I need something in there to fill it up, right? When you get into space, those sensors don't work because there is no gravity acting on it, you know. Uh, so the first few days you have to force yourself to eat and drink. 
I think if anything happened on the Apollo flights to the moon, the one thing that was constant on all of them is that everybody lost weight. Nobody gained weight on those flights. And it's usually a question of dehydration and not eating, enough, not eating the food they're supposed to eat. We force fed ourselves the first couple of days until our systems got used to that no gravity kind of indication telling us we're hungry. And, and once you get over that, then it's not too bad. Okay, now we come to the end of the story. Uh, what happens uh, after you've eaten enough and you've drank enough? Sooner or later, uh, you have to do something else, right? <laughs> that is, uh, we decided before our flight that we were going to be explorers and we were not going to be, we we're not going to be shy about anything, right? Well, I find out that takes a lot of willpower when you get in flight, but, uh, <laughs> but let me tell you how we disposed of the waste, right? Uh, the urine was easy. We just had relief tubes just like in an airplane uh, and that relief tube dumped into a plastic bag, a, a reservoir, if you will, and you just keep adding to that over a couple of days and then at some point in the flight you open a valve to the outside and the vacuum sucks that all out. Okay? So then you, 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 you cycle over and you start all over again. The interesting thing, when all that stuff gets sucked out, the interesting thing is that it, 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 it's, it's kind of a surprise because what you see out the side of the window is, is a cloud of snow. It's a white cloud of snow. It's not yellow, it's white. And that cloud of snow is unfortunately going the same direction, the same time, the same speed you are. <laughs> so, so, so unless we made a little mid-course maneuver somewhere along the line, we got that little cloud of snow to keep track of, you know, all the uh, That's, that one of the reasons, that's why we, that's why in our flight plan, we put in mid-course corrections to coincide with urine dumps <laughs> afterwards so that we'd get away from it. Okay, now we've taken care of the liquid. How about the solid stuff? Well, that's a little different. That's a little different. Uh, we had plastic bags. Now, I'm telling you this now, this is, this, is the, this is the way it is, right? If you don't want to know the way it is, then please leave. <laughs> uh, but we had plastic. This is where technology comes in handy. Yeah, isn't oh it? yeah, well, uh, we didn't have that. Anyway, plastic bags, and these plastic bags were about this long, about that big around, and on the open end they had an inch and a half flange that was adhesive. <laughs> Is this a demonstration or something? I wonder what that, finger. Uh, need, need, I, need I explain that anymore? Uh, I tell you what, uh, it was, it was, it's kind of interesting sitting in my seat and watching Dave float by with that bag. <laughs> I mean, you got, it, I, I don't want to draw a picture. I want you to draw your own picture of this. <laughs> but I'll tell you, that up close and personal stuff is really pretty bad. Anyway, okay, here, but here's the deal. When, when you're done, you, you've made your dump, okay. Now when you're done, you clean yourself up, you put all that back in this plastic bag, you seal the open, the adhesive part of it, you seal it, then you got to take out a pen and write your name on the bag and the time of flight. Because the doctors back in Houston, are, they, they, they're, they're determined, they get, they're going to analyze all that crap after the flight. You know? <laughs> so, so we got to save it. Well, I, well I'm going to tell you what happened to ours because it, it never got back to Earth. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of like, that's kind of like what it's like to, to live in space. And you get used to it. Um, our diurnal, diurnal cycle stayed the same as Houston. We stayed on the same time as Houston, so when they went to sleep at night, we went to sleep. How you decide that it's night in space is you put the shutters up at the windows. That's it, because the sun's always out there. Uh, we had a little problem with thermal heating uh, on the way out and on the way back from the moon. If you stay in one attitude and let the sun shine on just one side of the spacecraft, you got a big problem because the temperature on that surface is going to go up to about 350. And the temperature on the shadowed side, on the other side, is going to drop to about minus 250. So you got a 600 degree temperature differential across that spacecraft. And I don't think anybody trusted it that much. So what we did is 
on the way out, we had the lunar module stuck on our nose, and we turned perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic, and we just slowly rotated about once every two minutes, just to keep that heating rate constant around the outside of the spacecraft. And of course, that, yeah, the terminology was that was the barbecue maneuver, which is <laughs> kind of true. But that's how, we, that's how we took care of the thermal issue on the way out to the moon. Uh, once we got in lunar orbit, it wasn't so bad because uh, we're only um, seeing the sun for half a rev. And uh, here's another thing. I, you know, I, oh, go ahead. And you okay. guys should come up All to right. microphones here. Right. Okay, so right. if you have a question, please, you know. Okay, let me, let me explain something. I think everybody, you Google people particularly know the difference between the backside and the dark side. <laughs> you would not believe how many people do not understand that. The backside and the dark side. Now I'm going to tell you about the backside. It's not like the front side at all. And I don't know how much you all look at the moon or, or try and analyze it or whatever it is, but when you look at the moon, and your Google moon shows it, you see all those dark circles on the front side of the moon. Those are all meteor impact basins, every, every single one of them. But they were huge collisions, probably three, four billion years ago. Huge. Those things are 500 miles across. Dave and Jim had to fly over a 15,000 foot mountain to get to our landing site at Hadley Rill. That 15,000 foot mountain is the outer wave of that meteor impact basin on Mari Imbrium, 250 miles away from the center of impact. That's how dramatic and how huge these things were. Well, what happened is, meteor storm came through, plastered one side of the moon, <coughs> offset the center of gravity of the moon. And that's why we got one face of the moon looking at us all the time. <coughs> that's the back side. Of course, the dark side is just the side away from the sun. That's what gives us the faces. Take a question. Might as well. Yeah. Sir. So first of all, thank you for coming. Um, in the popular media, whenever you have one return, uh, you know, there's always the drama of reentry, where there's the the is a two, three, four minute blackout period where you know they're wondering are the parachutes going to come out? And, you know, <laughs> so, you know, we don't have that. What do you guys talk about on that during that time? <laughs> You, you've got a few minutes here. And, kind of and also, you well, did have a parachute problem. Well, yeah, we were, we were oohing and on about what we were looking at on the ground because I could see all of, uh, all of the North American continent, Alaska, Siberia, uh, J uh, Japan, down to the Philippines. I could see all of that at one time. So that was, we didn't say anything because I'm too, uh, you know, looking out the window. Um, you wait for the parachutes to come out. The, 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 there's a drag chute that comes out at about... 25,000 feet that, that really corrects our, our descent to come down vertically uh, and slows us down a little bit. The main chutes come out at 10,000 and then at uh, about uh, 6,000 feet we had an oh shit moment uh, because one of the chutes collapsed and uh, actually it burned up. Uh, we, had a, we had a chute that, 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 that uh, burned and as we were touching down a second chute was burning. And that was because we had what we called uh, 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 hypergolic fuel uh, that we used in the RCS quads. Uh, and that fuel, of course, you got two different kinds of fuel, and when they touch, they burn. Well, <laughs> they're very toxic and very dangerous m materials. So we purged all the fuel lines before we touched down to make sure that if we hit something in the ocean, we wouldn't burst the line and then we'd have a problem. Uh, when we purged the fuel lines, uh, they, they, they went right up that one riser yeah, because we didn't have any surface wind that day. And uh, the, it, normally the thing would be going horizontal and that fuel would be going this way. But you know, on our day, we were, we were stationary coming straight down and the fuel went straight up. And it, it, it burned big holes in one, in, in one of the uh, parachutes uh, and it collapsed. And uh, just as we were touching down in the water, the second one was starting to burn. So we were pretty lucky we got down when we did. But that was an old, oh gosh, moment, yeah, yeah coming down, yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Um, you were talking about, uh, repeatedly talking about flying the, the lunar module or the command module. Um, I was, it was occurring to me that maneuvering a spacecraft has got to be very different from atmospheric flight. You've got an atmosphere to maneuver against to slow you down. I'm wondering if the 
um, the reactions that you learn as an atmospheric pilot, are they applicable to space flight? Are they possibly even a hindrance? Mm. Interesting question. Uh, <coughs> you, you do, uh, the difference between flying an airplane and flying a spacecraft is when you fly in an airplane, you're always going forward, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and when you fly a spacecraft, you're going in any direction. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, we actually flew towards the moon backwards, uh, which didn't affect our, 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 where, our location. Uh, but we went in backwards because we had to do a retrograde maneuver behind the moon to slow down to stay in lunar orbit. So we never saw the moon until we were at 60 miles. And that's a, that, that's a point in the flight when we really put all of our faith in mission control uh, to make sure. But when you're in, when you're in space, um, there, there's no restriction on attitude or anything. You can just go, you can point in any direction. That spacecraft's going to go that way no matter what you do unless you actually fire an engine to change your velocity vector. But if you don't change your velocity vector, you're going in that direction and there's nothing you can do about it. And you can roll, you can, you can do anything you want. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. There, there's some things in space that are kind of fun that, that we can't do down here. Uh, along, that, along that line, we took out the center couch one day. Well, we had it out a lot of the time because it gave us more room to move around. To move around. We got Jim Irwin to roll up in a ball and Dave and I stood on either side of him and we started him spinning. We thought that'd be kind of a neat experiment to run up there. And uh, he's spinning and he's all curled up on a ball and say, okay, Jim, stick your arm out. And he'd stick his arm out and uh, slow right down. Pull his arm in, speed right up. So that was kind of fun. We didn't let that go on too long because we were afraid Jim would get sick. But, <laughs> but, but, but space is an entire, there's another dimension that uh, we're going to have to get used to if we really uh, well, not, that, not, not getting used to it. We got used to it pretty quickly in our flight. But learning how to deal with it in a flight kind of way, to go somewhere, uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to have a lot of, there's going to be a, 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 a lot of studies, a lot of research, uh, a lot of development done. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> I admire you for challenging the impossible and doing amazing things. Um, it's been Didn't know it was impossible. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have tried it if I thought it was impossible. <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been 40 years since the heyday of the Apollo program, and today we've lost our, or we've given up our manned flight capability. What do you think it'll take to get America back into space? New president. <laughs> I think that's the big key to it. He doesn't like space. And, I, and let me, and I'm not being, I'm being very, uh, quite serious about that but not, maybe not in the way you, you might think. Space flight to me, it's nice. We're gonna go somewhere eventually so that we got a place to go when the Earth, when we can't live here anymore. But that might be a billion years from now, so there's no big rush. But it's gonna happen. There's a genetic drive in us that says we're gonna go into space regardless, and we may go through cycles and it may be 100 years between cycles or maybe 50 years or whatever it is. Right now we're in the bottom of a cycle. And I do believe that it's going to come back because we're going to keep pressing on. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the big problem is propulsion. And so, you know, we're going to have to take some time to resolve or to solve the propulsion problem. Uh, but I believe that we have that genetic drive that's going to push us out there to the point where we're going to find another planet where we can live on it someday. And it may, like I say, it may be a billion years from now. Um, so right now we're in kind of the doldrums, but, I, but the problem I have with, with us shutting down on the program is two things. One is that the program is responsible one way or another for an awful lot of technology development in the last 50 years. I believe that we wouldn't have silicon chips today if, if, the, if the government uh, and, the, and the military and NASA hadn't supported the development of of silicon chips. Now we're way beyond that today. We're into MEMS, we're into nanotechnology and a lot of other stuff today uh, that's way beyond the original silicon chip. But I'll guarantee you that the success this country's had in the last 40 years basically is based on a silicon chip. Everything we've got has a silicon chip in it. My watch. I mean it's everything. That watch incidentally has got more memory capacity than my computer on board. Uh, but. But I do believe that when we decide that we're going to back off from a 
technology development program such as the space program, then we got problems. That's leading into keeping businesses very, very productive in this country. And the other thing that we're going to lose, which I think is really dreadful, is the motivation for young people to go to school. And I think in the last 40 years, the greatest motivator that young people have had to get, not only go to school but get good grades and follow it through is the possibility that they might work in a space program someday. And I have to tell young people today, hey, we're in the doldrums right now. We, you know, we got this guy that doesn't like space. Uh, so we're, we're, we're really not doing much right now. I'm, well, I'm, I'm not happy with the attitude. I, and it's not just Obama. It's the whole Washington scene that I'm not happy with today. Uh, they've, they've really lost track of what this country's all about. Um, but I, 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 I really think that uh, young people today, uh, without us having an active manned space program, um, they have to kind of take it on faith that it's going to come back. And that's a, that's a tough sell. That's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, you started off talking about the, uh, the role of astronauts as pilots and contrasting it with the uh, Soviet Union's approach where the cosmonauts mm -hmm. were really more like passengers in a lot of ways. Uh, in his book, The Right Stuff, Tom Wolfe makes a big deal about the fact that, according to him, uh, the American engineers originally wanted to treat the astronauts as, as they like to say in the book at least, spam in a can or a monkey in a bucket and that the astronauts had to kick up a huge fuss in order to retain their role as pilots. Uh, is that really a realistic account of, of how that worked and did that happen in your experience or is this just Tom Wolf telling a ripping good yarn? Well, I think Tom got it mostly right. Uh, he was a great writer and I, sp I spent a lot of time with him when he wrote that book. Um, there's always, there's, there's always um, a problem, a difference of opinion about how you do things. How much automation do you put into something? How much manual control do you put into something? And how do the two integrate together? How do you manage all of that? Uh, and yes, some of the original seven guys were pretty strong uh, about flying that thing. Uh, and the Mercury was uh, pretty much, as you probably, probably are aware, and many of you, if you've studied all this stuff, is that uh, Scott Carpenter had a lot of problems on his flight because he couldn't manually get it to where it's supposed to be for reentry, And that caused him a lot of trouble, 200 miles downrange and all that kind of thing. Um, as far as I know, I never heard an argument that says we need to do it more automated than we were doing it. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were pretty, pretty set on, on doing all the flying in, in, uh, ourselves. Now, we had a computer that, that, that helped us a lot, but uh, that, we, didn't, we never developed a system that would allow the ground to automatically dock one of our spacecraft to the International Space Station. We don't have that program. They got to do it manually. And I, don't, and I don't recall there ever being discussion to make it more uh, automated than that. Mm -hmm. Two questions, if I may. Um, the first one is vis-a-vis -vis your comment about the doldrums that we're in today with respect to space exploration and so on. Uh, what's your perspective about the role of private industry uh, in that? Private area? industry in space? Sure. Uh, gee, my my attitude about that's pretty well known. I think. Uh, uh, you just <laughs> we just we just talked about that yeah. at lunch. You know. Um, it's controversial. It's great. Well, I, I yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, private industry will probably have a role in space at some point. Uh, they might be the taxi cab to get to the International Space Station. Uh, private industry will not take us beyond that. They can't. They won't. Why? What's the goal of a private industry? Make a profit. If they can't see a profit in a program, then they're probably not going to do it. Uh, <clears throat> they can see a profit in taking guys up to the space station because their customer, the U.S. government, is going to pay them. My attitude about that is if we're going to pay somebody to take us to the International Space Station and we're going to pr provide them with a profit to do that, we might as well take that money and do it ourselves. I don't believe in a third man. Uh, I, think, I think the flip side of that is that the government tends not to be very efficient about things that they do, so it costs a lot more money. 
uh, in private industry is going to get right to the heart of it. But I also am concerned private industry is going to give the bare bones stuff to get a guy up there and back. Uh, there may be some corners that get cut short. There may be some things that uh, that are left out that shouldn't be. Um, I don't know. I don't know that for a fact. Uh, but I know that when when I've got a when when I've got a project and it's got a cost limit to it, and I got to do certain things with that, then I'm going to jam that program into there to make sure that I do it for the money. Uh, the government doesn't have that restriction. I mean, if it runs into a problem, you know, it, it's it's going to it's going to fix the problem. The government's interest in all of this is safety for the crew. Private industry's interest in all this is a profit, and I I see that as a big big change. At the same time, I don't see private industry ever going beyond the the Earth orbit, because what private company is going to send a crew to the to Mar to Mars, let's say, uh, on the off chance that there might be something there that'd be profitable? <laughs> I I I don't see that happening. So, so the government's role in all this is going to be the long range stuff, and private industry is going to do the space, do the, just the Earth orbital stuff. And so far. Um, there are some companies that are working on it. Uh, we'll see how they do. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm probably not as optimistic about it as I should be. And the second question, very quickly. Um, it struck me earlier, you mentioned that when you were uh, training and guiding the spaceship, that you guided to this blue sort of bridge or blue line in the atmosphere. How did you train for that on Earth? I mean, I, I can't imagine that you saw the same thing down here as you saw up there. It's projected on a screen, but but it was all it was it was all connected to a very sophisticated computer program that measured all those things. Uh, it was done at MIT, at the Stark Draper Labs, and uh, they designed uh, the whole nav system that we used. Uh, and and uh, I don't I don't think we could have done it without them. Uh, you know, Draper Labs started out doing inertial navigation systems for submarines years and years and years ago, and they designed our system. Let me tell you a, a good example. Uh, we're gone. We're gone two weeks. We had uh, we had one attitude indicator. We had one gyro, one inertial reference frame, if you will. It's a three-axis frame with a little gyro on each axis, uh, and we had to. Uh, adjust that inertial reference frame as we went because it would drift. There's no way you can prevent it from drifting a little bit. But what those guys at MIT did for us was they, fig they, they worked out a program that kept track of the drift rates. And after, we'd, after we had uh, realigned the platform uh, after a couple of days, the computer then took over and pulsed each of the three axes on the inertial reference platform just enough to take out the drift that was in there. We never touched that thing again for the whole flight. Now, we had one gyro on board to go all the way to the moon and back. The shuttle has three, okay, just to go to Earth orbit. We had one computer, the shuttle has four. Uh, guess which has the highest probability of success? Ours. Of course, the problem is we're either 100% or zero. Uh, and the shuttle, if you take the shuttle, you take the probability of success of the computer system in the shuttle, you got one that's, the, each of them are like 0.95%. Okay, ours was 0.95% or zero. Well, you got to multiply all four of them out. And you get a fairly low reliability number when you end up. And that's kind of the situation we found too. The philosophy back when the Apollo program was build one, test the heck out of it, make sure it's right, and, and, and use it on the flight. Now, our, our gyro was, probably 10 years old when we flew. It was an air-bearing gyro, but it was only one. Uh, guess what we had? To, if we lost a gyro, okay, let's say we lost a gyro, or we lost our computer in flight. Uh, we lost something that, uh, that uh, um, where we lost any information we needed on where we were and what our attitude was and all that. In other words, we had no attitude and no location. What do we do? Well, we had a backup for that. And our backup was a telescope, kind of. Actually, it was a World War II uh, um, um, it was a World War II fighter optical gun sight. And we had, we had uh, uh, the crosshairs on the gun sight, 
and, you, and we'd mount that in the window and you could look through, you could line up the two crosshairs and the ground would tell us which star to line up on. That would give us our attitude. You don't make, it doesn't make any difference what your role, what your role is as long as your central axis is pointed to that star. And they say, tell us how much to fire the engines, two feet per second or five feet per second or something, on a certain direction. Um, and that would get us back home. So we had a very good way of getting back home, even if we lost everything except the radio. <coughs> but the attitude was, we're going to take something that's very, very reliable. We're going to test it to the point where we are absolutely convinced that it's going to work. And we never had a problem in the Apollo program with that, with going that way. So it was kind of a neat thing. Could you uh, tell us a bit about your duties when you were alone in orbit and why the Apollo capsule required a babysitter? Um, well, I'm sorry, I didn't get the... Why did the Apollo capsule require a babysitter? Why couldn't it have just been left unmanned? Left unmanned? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was during Skylab. I don't agree. Uh, Constellation is thinking about doing that, and I do not agree with that. Like I said before, my, my, my uh, example of soup floating around inside, if something like that happens and that thing's unmanned, you've got a problem. Big problem. Something as simple as a little water leak inside that command module could destroy it. Uh, the original idea for Constellation was to go to the moon and send the whole crew down to the surface, leave the command module in orbit by itself, station keeping by itself, without somebody on board. Now, I totally disagree with that. Because it, for six months, you better believe in six months something's going to go wrong. So I, I, I don't believe, I, don't, I, I think that's a very, very dangerous philosophy. You kept pretty busy up there, too. Well, yeah, I the had... The schedule in that uh, command module was grueling. Uh, we did. I worked, uh, basically, I worked 20 hours a day. Uh, I had a lot of things. Some really, really exciting things, too, but <coughs> the basic stuff I did was I photographed with the high-resolution camera, like on your Google Moon. I think some of that's mine. Um, and with a mapping camera, uh, that had a laser altimeter that took the altitude right in the middle of the picture. Uh, carried uh, a whole bunch of remote sensing devices that were on extendable poles, like I had an X-ray spectrometer, gamma ray spectrometer, um, I had a mass spectrometer, uh, I forget the others we had, but we had like five of them, uh, that, that I used to scan the surface of the moon. And the idea there is, these were the remote sensing devices that were complementary to uh, 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 the chemistry of the rocks that we thought we'd see on the surface. So when Dave and Jim brought rocks back, they did a chemical composition analysis, and then they compared that with what we got from remote sensing, and now we can go to the moon without landing and, and find out what the chemical composition of the surface is anywhere we want to look, just doing it remotely. So that was one of the things. And I'm constantly, those poles coming in and out and all that, that's to tell you, tell you another little story. We had a mass spectrometer. It was on a 30-foot pole that went outside, that went out of the, uh, you know, to get it outside the, any influence that the spacecraft might have. And that was to check to see if there were any particles in lunar orbit, anything that we could see in lunar orbit. So we're up there going round and round, and uh, 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 ground calls me, I'm by myself up there, and they ground, the ground calls me, they said, uh, we're picking up something on the mass spectrometer. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, something in lunar orbit. Yeah, well, something is in the atmosphere. Uh, we'll let you know. So they called me back a few hours later, and they said, we figured out what it is. I said, oh, okay, what is it? They said, well, chemical composition, it's urine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, gee, that's interesting, since we had just done a urine dump about four revolutions before. So we're, so we're picking up ourselves in lunar orbit as we're going around. Uh, but I was very busy, and I did a lot of visual observations. Uh, we had really trained hard on the features of the moon because there was still a lot of discussion about whether the features were formed by meteor impacts or by volcanism, volcanoes. And so we had a lot of that. As a matter of fact, I found a field of uh, cinder cones, which, as many of you know, is the last kind of gasp of a volcanic uh, eruption. And in fact, when we got back, that was verified and they changed the landing site for Apollo 17 to go to that area. So that was kind of a, kind of a neat thing. Um, I also took a lot, of, I did some really interesting photography, I thought. 
uh, I did what we call low light level photography. Now, I don't know. You're all too young. You don't even know anything about film. Uh, <laughs> but uh, back in those days, we carried film. And uh, I, had a, I, I, I managed to carry on the flight uh, a camera uh, that was made by Nikon. It had a lens that was a 1.01 lens, which is like 99.99% clear. And I carried a film that had an ASA of 5,000. Now, film, normal film back in those days, was like ASA of 400, 300, 200, something like that. I carried film that was 5,000. It was a special film for very low light phenomena. And I guarantee you I could go out in, outside crew quarters down at the Cape and take a picture of a parking lot where there, it was totally black. All there was was sky glow. And it would look like daylight. I mean, this film was that good. That so I took pictures of very low light phenomena. Um, and I'll tell you what they are. One is uh, one of the Lagrange points. If you know your Lagrange points, there are five of them. Three of them in a row in the in, in the, uh, uh, on a line through the center of the Earth and the center of the Moon. There are two offset. The two that are offset are the ones that are stable equilibrium points. Uh, there's a thing in this country called the L5 Society, which is uh, focused on, on, on Lagrange point number five as being the perfect place for a space station, which is, which is correct, by the way. Because it's stable, it, it, it's, it's stab stable equilibrium. It's a stable equilibrium point. If you put something there, it's going to stay there. If you perturb something at that point, push it out, then all the dynamics of that point are going to pull it back in. So everything's going to stay there. <coughs> That's true. There should be a dust cloud at L5, right? There should be something there if you could get a picture of it. Nobody ever got a picture of this. So I got out my low light level camera and I did uh, 10 second exposures with ASA 5000 film. That's unbelievable. You cannot stop the smear. You can't keep the spacecraft that steady for five, ten seconds. But even with a smear, yes, sure enough, there's a cloud there. There is a cloud of dust there. So we know that that's it. The other thing that I took these low light level pictures of is the thing called the Gegenschein. The Gegenschein is outside the last planet. It's a, it's a, it's a ring of loose, unconsolidated rock. When the solar system was formed, it's rock that never formed a planet. And it's outside. And all it is is a ring of this rock. And if you go to the highest mountain in the Himalayas or uh, in the Andes or someplace like that, you get up there high enough, you get, good, you know, get out of most of the atmosphere, you can sometimes see it. Because you, what you see is the reflection of the sunlight off all those particles out there. Got pictures of that, too. So there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff we did uh, in addition to focusing on the moon itself. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. It's something that blew my mind. There was a portion of my orbit where I was on the backside and on the dark side at the same time. It was just a, like a pie-shaped wedge around the side of the moon. And from that vantage point, I, 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 the thing that really captured my imagination was the rest of the universe out there. All of a sudden, we had 37 stars that were the brightest stars in the sky that I used as navigation stars. When I got to that sector of the orbit around the moon, I couldn't find them because there are so many stars. It, I could not pick out an individual star anywhere because it was just a wash of light. You see every star, and you can't pick out an individual star. It's a, absolutely amazing. You never believe. But the faint stars get shut off, get cut off by, by, by the seeing or the, the absorption through the atmosphere. So what we really look at through the atmosphere here is the brightest stars. You get outside the atmosphere, they're all coming at you, and, and I could absolutely define the, the horizon of the moon by the light that was cut off, not by the light shining on it. Okay, that made me do a little research, and, and I'm sure there are people here that know this a lot better than I am, better than I know it. But what it made me think about was, what's the rest of the universe like? It's one thing to look back at the Earth, and we know that's the place we come from, and they, we, know, we know, you know, it's, a, it's the most colorful thing in the solar system and all that. When you look at the rest of the universe, you've got to put on a different hat. You realize that we are part of the Milky Way galaxy. We look through it sideways. We don't look at it from on top. We look through it sideways. And the estimate of the number, anybody know how many stars there are in the Milky Way galaxy? Anybody got an idea? 200 million. Exactly. 200 
200 billion with a B. And I've seen estimates as high as 400 billion. But I think 200 billion is a reasonable number. 200 billion stars in our own little galaxy? Come on. Now, how many galaxies are out there? 100 billion. There you go. And that's only because that's as far as we can see. So you got 100 billion times 200 billion. There are a few stars out there. You, you we do don't, the math. We don't have, well, the whole point is we as people, as a, as a thinking species, we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. Anybody wants to talk about uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Right on, man. It's out there. It's out there. Now, people ask me about UFOs and I say, bring me a piece of one. That's the only way you're going to convince me. But is there life out there? Absolutely. No question about it. Probably a lot smarter than we are. That's why they don't come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, I'd like to thank...